So we might get started then. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce everybody that we have speaking today. So we have Tyler Hollenbeck, who is a lawyer at DLA Piper in Seattle. Um, we've both used him and had portfolio companies use him in a lot of deals, particularly around flip -ups. So um, he's you know, a great person to have on this. And then the other person we have as well, hi Alistair, is Matt Fairhurst, who's CEO and founder of Schedulo, which is a Blackbird portfolio company. Most of you know Matt. Matt recently flipped up last year and used Tyler to help with that process. So he's going to speak about um, his experience uh, on the co company founder side and a little bit about R&D and the implications for that as well. So uh, first of all, we'll start off with Tyler and he's just going to go, th go through the ABCs a little bit of, of what flip ups are and why you might do it. And we really want this to be kind of interactive. So I'm going to kind of pause as much as possible to allow you guys to ask questions um, and do try and make it as specific to your needs as possible. Um, so over to you, Tyler. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. And thanks so much for having me and uh, nice to meet all of you virtually. Um, so yeah, as Sam said, I'm going to try to do this conversationally and kind of do the what, when, where, why of flips uh, for you in sort of bullet format. So I'll pause in between and you know, check and see if there's any questions. Um, certainly feel free to interrupt me. There's no sort of formal agenda here. Um, I also understand from Sam that you're all probably fairly familiar with the concept of a flip and, and probably most of the folks here are at some stage of thinking about it and have considered it. So I'll, I'll try to you know, be pretty quick on the sort of what is a flip and how would you structure it because that might be a little elementary for you. But you know, essentially the idea of a flip is uh, moving your jurisdiction of incorporation. And the reason that they call it a flip is that you usually do so by flipping your existing entity in the, you know, in this case, Australia, the Australian entity up into a new parent co-entity in the jurisdiction where you're trying to flip up into. Um, there's, in different types of transactions, there's different parent co-structures that you might want to use. Um, you might be familiar with LLCs in the US, but I think for most of you, what you're considering is your obviously venture-backed, um, you know, tech-based startups. And I think for most folks, the reason to flip up into the US uh, it would be to seek capital there and because U.S. investors are more comfortable and familiar with investing in U.S. companies. So given that that's likely the um, basis for doing the flip up, there's really one defined path and structure for the flip up in that context, which is to set up a U.S. C corporation, which is, um, you know, a, a taxable entity, not a pass through entity at the U.S. level, which is the preferred type of entity for U.S. investors to invest into. So Effectively, that what that means for flipping up your Australian entity into a U.S. A US C Corp is that you, each of the equity holders or security holders in the Australian entity would agree via an exchange agreement to exchange all of their shares in the Australian entity for identical shares or whatever security, if there's options outstanding for options, in the new U.S. C Corporation. And so by doing so, the new U.S. C Corp becomes the sole stockholder of the Australian sub, so it's a wholly owned subsidiary, and the share or equity ownership of the Australian sub is, is effectively completely duplicated at the U.S. C Corp level. Um, and that duplication is really critical for, you know, my next question, which is what are the tax implications on both the Australian and the U.S. side? Um, and, and the answer to that is if you exactly duplicate the rights and the ownership um, of the Australian entity at the US entity level, then it should be a tax-free exchange on both the Australian and the US side. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's really the, the goal, of course, is to keep any tax impact out and to, um, to mirror the rights identically. Uh, where that can become a little bit tricky is if you have a more complicated cap structure, if you're maybe a more advanced portfolio company in Australia and you have uh, multiple series of preferred stock, if you have convertible notes, if you have options and warrants and those sorts of things. Um, if, the, if the company in Australia only has founders common stock or maybe some founders common stock and some, uh, some one series of preferred from the Blackbird investment, for example, uh, then much, much easier and cleaner to mirror and duplicate those rights exactly. Uh, once you start getting into options and convertible notes, customary practice in Australia can be slightly different than customary practice in the US. So there's a little bit of analysis and shoehorning that has to be done to make sure that the rights are identically mirrored in the US um, as they are in Australia. And that's where costs and timeline can kind of vary a little bit. And those were my, those were my um, 
next two questions to address, which were how long does the process take and what's the cost? But before Can I- Can I maybe ask, yeah, yeah. One, qu one question related to that, Tyler, because um, I think it did come up um, a couple of times, was um, what happens when um, you issue common stock um, in your Australian company to investors um, and then you flip up into the US and obviously you want to issue common stock potentially to US employees. Is there an issue there um, that ever comes up? There isn't an issue from the from a tax perspective as long as as long as the investors in Australia are okay getting um, the same common stock that the founders and the option holders get. But what I've seen a couple of times, and I think what you might be alluding to, is that in Australia, um, you know the the concept of the share and then the rights of those shares can be a little bit disaggregated and that you know as a as a creature of contract you could have the same class of shares as somebody else but then you could be given a whole bunch of separate rights with respect to those shares so what you know you guys would say is you know an investor having common in us parlance might be an investor having sort of common plus or seed preferred and so that's part of what you have to analyze when you're when you're mirroring the rights is whether there actually is, from a U.S. perspective, a distinction in the rights between the founders common and the investors common, in which case what I've done and I've been told by Australian tax colleagues um, works from the, from the you know, tax-free perspective is to then put the, uh, the investor um, common into actually a seed preferred at the U.S. level give, and mirroring those same rights. So what you call it isn't actually as important as what the what the rights are, and so as long as you mirror the rights, you know the tax the tax laws take a take a practical view, and if you mirror the rights, that's the most important thing. Ah, that was that was one of my questions uh, from Nick. What happens if you have a C corp currently as a subsidiary of the Australian entity? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so. Um, some people, you know, the, the first instinct with that is, oh, great, well, I can just use my existing C Corp and flip that up, you know, rather than being a sub of the Australian entity, I can make it a parent of the US entity. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't work. And it's a little bit of an arcane tax reason in the US that I'll, I'll spare you from, but that entity already has 100% stock ownership. So when you would be exchanging 100% stock ownership by the Australian entity, the, um, so when you're exchanging the Australian shareholder shares for equity in that US C Corp, if you were to try to use the existing US C Corp, you couldn't avail yourself of the particular US tax code that allows you to issue the founder's stock tax-free. So you can't mm -hmm. use your existing subsidiary. So that's, that's the first problem related to that. The second is that there is under the international tax treaty between the US and Australia, from a transfer pricing perspective, there's a major problem if there's what's called a sandwich corporation, where you have a US parent co, which would be the new top co that we'd be forming in the flip up, then an Australian sub below that, and then an Australian, or I'm sorry, then another US sub below the Australian sub. It's called a sandwich problem because the Australian entity is sandwiched between the two US entities. Um, I, I won't pretend to tell you that I understand the policy rationale for that, but somewhere in the treaty, I've been told by my international tax colleagues, there's some major problem that screws up the international tax transfer pricing analysis there. So you have to get out of that sandwich problem while you're doing the flip up. And um, uh, I can go into that in a little more detail. Matt, um, actually, you know, we, we dealt with this issue as well uh, with Matt and Schedulo. So uh, that, that there's a little bit, that's kind of a tangent. So I might, um, push pause on that and talk about sort of, you know, the more generic process and timeline and cost first, and then come back to how to deal with the sandwich problem towards the end, if that works okay for everybody. Okay, great. Um, so then in terms of uh, how long the process takes, you know, this is really tied to the question of what your existing cap structure looks like, and also, how, honestly, how clean the cap records are. Um, you know, everybody understands with startup companies, sometimes things are done a little bit fast and loose, and the the records in the early stages aren't um, aren't totally locked down, but with the flip up, you really have to make sure that those records are all locked down. So, you know, if you only had founder stock, common stock, and maybe you know some some one in series of investor preferred, or maybe this this investor common that has special rights that Sam and I just talked about, um, you know, the process should be pretty quick. You know, a couple of weeks to, to maybe a, maybe three weeks to a month uh, to draft the documents. You know, get sort of sign off from both Australian and U.S. folks. And, um, and you know, file the charter in the US and all that. It easily could be done in two weeks if everything was firing on all four cylinders. The, the complications 
typically arise in all the stuff around the sort of baseline case. Um, oftentimes, people are doing a flip up because they've uh, already secured a U.S. investor uh, and you know are ready to pull the trigger on the investment. And so the flip up would happen sort of almost concurrently with the investment and the US investor and their counsel would want to be diligencing and reviewing all of the flip up documents as well as the financing documents. So that can obviously significantly delay things because now you have a whole other party and their counsel reviewing and getting in the middle of it. Um, and so, you know, in that scenario, you know, things can stretch out a couple of months or, or more. And then if you add in any sort of cleanup issues that you have to deal with, um, for example, if you have convertible notes, um, you know, you can either try to mirror the convertible notes in, in the U.S., uh, although that is a little trickier from a tax perspective, de depending on the features of the convertible notes, whether that would be tax free or not. So you have to analyze in your particular circumstances, um, or you can con try to convert them pre-closing in Australia into outstanding equity and then flip up that equity structure. Um, or if you're doing it concurrent with the financing, you can sort of do it all, all at once. Um, of those sorts of issues can obviously really extend out the timeline. Um, and, and that actually, I, something that I should have hit on earlier that uh, I just remembered is a good point, which is, you know, if the primary purpose of the flip up is to raise U.S. capital, when should you do it? And I think the answer there, and, you know, there might be different circumstances that might di dictate a different approach, but generally I would say the answer is you should wait until you have a U.S. investor ready to invest. Um, because the cost of doing this, as I'll talk about in a, in a minute, and the go-forward administrative implications of having, you know, entities in multiple jurisdictions, um, and as Matt will probably talk about the, the implications and the complications with making sure you can still take advantage of the R&D uh, tax credit in Australia, are, are, are not insignificant. They're, you know, they're manageable, but they're not immaterial. So until you really are certain that you have a U.S. investor, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to do the flip-up. So in most cases, I would say, unless there's some extra circumstance that's, that's causing the flip-up to happen, you know, in advance of really having a deal ready in the U.S., you do it concurrently with financing. So in that scenario, it's, it's going to take longer than, you know, two weeks because you're going to have other parties in and you're going to be negotiating financing documents at the U.S. level and all of those sorts of things that, that complicate it. Um, so then from a cost perspective, um, you know, the answer here is, is, is the same as, as the one that I gave on the timeline, that it's really dependent on what, what all is going on and what the particular facts on the ground are. And it's also complicated by what the terms of the US financing are. Um, so to sort of separate out some of that noise, I thought I'd sort of give the base case, you know, again, if you have common stock and maybe one series of preferred um, and that's it, what's the, what's the base case um, cost? And there, you know, it's probably about $15,000 US, which is inclusive of some uh, Australian stamp duty filings and other other filings that have to be made in Australia that's inclusive of you know quick Australian tax advice um, I'm sort of quoting it from my perspective where DLA has presence on both sides so you know that that includes our Australian colleagues sort of signing off on the on the tax aspect of it um, if you didn't have you know a, a law firm where they had presence in both countries I think that 15k should hopefully be split up between your Australian advisors and your US advisors um, and that's for basically just the process of, you know, analyzing the cap table, preparing the, the rights, preparing the exchange documents, preparing the U.S. corporations formation documents that parallel those of the Australian entity. Um, that is obviously much more expensive than, you know, if, if you were starting from scratch and just forming a U.S. entity, you know, uh, from scratch, the cost there would be more like $2,500 um, U.S. So you know, the bulk of that cost is really analyzing and ensuring that you're duplicating the rights of the Australian entity and the U.S. entity. So the simpler your organizational documents in, in Australia are from a capitalization perspective, the more pr downward pressure you can put on that cost because there's less time needed to run the analysis on both, both, sides of the, both sides of the coin and make sure that, you know, the rights are being exactly duplicated. Um, and then the other component to the cost, which is you know, not insignificant is the international uh, pricing transfer tax issue. And, you know, that I'll, I think we'll talk about, and I'll, I'll maybe talk about briefly, but let Matt talk about it as well, what the implications um, of a flip up are on uh, international transfer tax pricing, but most importantly on, on the IP ownership and the RMB credits in Australia. Um, so, uh, you know, that's an important part of the transaction and the cost there is variable because as I think you'll, you'll hear when we talk about 
what the transfer tax implications are. It's a little bit dependent on the circumstances of the company that's doing the flip up and how their sales model will operate, which, um, which international tax treaty approach you can take advantage of. Uh, and that will, that will dictate cost. So, you know, if you have a fairly clean and simple approach where you can use what's called a distribution model, costs can be pretty limited um, around, you know, I think 5K US, um, maybe a little bit higher. If you have a more complicated model uh, that maybe involves the sandwich problem that we talked about before, um, which I'll get to in a minute, you know, costs can, can really increase from there. Uh, so, you know, that, that's sort of um, baseline cost if everything were really clean and simple, 20, $25,000 US uh, total would, would be a, like sort of a baseline best case scenario. But frankly, I've, I've, I've never done one for that cost because there's always complicating factors. Um, and then you layer in the cost of doing the US financing as well. And that, um, you know, that's a significant cost as well. That's highly variable depending on the nature of the terms of the US financing um, and, and all sorts of other factors. So, you know, the, the all in cost is, is pretty significant here. Um, you know, if, if you think of 25 as sort of the base case and then, you know, moving up from there uh, pretty significantly in cases where there's a big financing with, with um, heavy terms and a lot of cleanup and complications in the cap structure ahead of time. Um, which is, I think, puts even further pressure on not wanting to do this and incur that cost until you're really ready to get the concurrent U.S. financing. So I'll maybe um, pause there again for a minute, and then I can talk about the R&D tax credit and the sandwich problem a little bit more. Oh, Sam, I think mm -hmm. you're on mute. Oh, there you uh are. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, yeah, just invite anyone to ask any questions they had on, on any of that. I mean, given the timeline and, and the expense that you sort of talked about, Tyler, and, and maybe Matt, you could jump in. I mean, do you almost wish that uh, people just started with the Delaware C Corp? Um, is that, uh, it, yeah, or is true. it still worth, is it still worth um, starting in Australia? And yeah, just I mean, only having that expense when you actually have the funds to pay for it when you're raising money? Yeah, I think if you know you're definitively going to be seeking capital in the US, and that's, that's you know, without a doubt the plan, uh, then it's definitely much easier if you start with a, with a U.S. C Corp because dropping down an Australian sub from a U.S. C Corp is incredibly simple and then mm -hmm. you can deal with the R&D tax credit from there. Um, I think the, you know, challenge is many Australian entrepreneurs don't definitively know that they're... No, yeah. <laughs> don't know if you'll be alive in six months, so it's yeah. hard to predict those yeah. things. Yeah, exactly. So I think oh, that's yeah. probably an unlikely scenario, but yeah, the deal from my perspective. I, I agree. I think that if you know and you have a crystal ball of exactly how this is going to play out and you've potentially even done it before, then that would be a sensible uh, way to go. But I think the reality of building a business and, you know, being founders and, and even starting that process in Australia, uh, unless you're immediately going to the US, you don't necessarily um, know exactly what that's going to look like. But if you do intend on raising capital in the US and that's your absolute clear vision of, of how you're going to raise capital, then it does, it does make sense. Um, as Tyler's identified though, you know, certainly the longer you leave it, the more costly it gets, but there is somewhat of a baseline cost of doing it. So, you know, is the, the money and the process and the additional um, legal cost when you're literally starting out and starting an organization worth it just to avoid the cost and pain in the future, you know, I think that's probably something that would have to be considered on an individual basis. But um, you know, at the same time, you don't want to leave it too late because the longer you leave it and the more complex your structure gets in Australia before you tackle this problem. Um, if you do start raising in the US and you have a compelling need to do so, then uh, the more expensive it's going to get. Um, the other thing I'd say in extension to what Tyler was talking about before is when once you do have that compelling event and you have a bit of a time horizon, to get this done, um, you know, once you've found that legal quarterback and that person that is going to help you through not only a fundraising process but a flip-up legal process, um, you know, m make sure you're really clear about everything that you're doing and, and that there'll be a flip-up involved and um, it, make sure that all of that information is shared well ahead of time. The last thing you want to do is like leave it till you've got a term sheet signed and you're ready to go through the legal process of raising money and then you suddenly drop it in the lap of whoever you're working with that uh, you're also doing a flip up and you've, you've, no one is prepared for that situation. You could potentially blow a fundraising exercise by months. 
um, you know, it obviously adds complexity to that whole process. So um, the timing of not only whether you do it at the start or whether you do it later, but also uh, getting your ducks in a row when you're doing it is pretty, uh, pretty important to recognize. So that's an interesting one um, because so Nick DeBonis is in the States right now sort of fundraising for their Series A, well, it's probably second seed, I guess, by, by US standards. Um, and if, you know, if they are successful in getting US leads that they'll probably have to flip up. Um, it's a pretty simple structure here in, in Australia. Should he be trying to tidy up that subsidiary, uh, that, that C Corp subsidiary that the Australian company has now? Um, in order to, you know, be able to move quickly. I think it, I think the thing is over there, he's over there represent, sorry to speak for you, Nick, but um, he's over there sort of saying, yeah, we're in Australia. I mean, they already have um, part of the business working in LA. Um, it's pretty fast no if you sort of say, oh, we're based in Sydney, but we're going to move over. If you'd please, pretty please give us a term sheet. And, um, and so he's sort of over there as if he had already raised, so to speak, and was based in the US because that's the, that's the plan um, yeah I mean that was the same that? That, yeah that was the same for us as well I mean mm -hmm. I'd, I'd been working here in the US and we had a, a US company as a subsidiary to the Australian one for quite a while so there was already a fair amount of complexity structure history tax liabilities all that sort of stuff that is, was in place um, so yeah I mean that's definitely not a, a rare situation I think in in uh, some instances, I, I think uh, to answer the question, if, if the question is, should he be um, kicking off the process of like cleaning up a lot of the legal entity stuff between the, the US Co and the Australian Co now uh, to preempt the raise, I would say like, um, yes, in, in that you should get your legal counsel involved, you should have a plan together for what the overall process is going to look like. Um, do you want to go dropping a ton of cash on kicking that process off? before you've got a term sheet and before you've really closed around, you know where you want to spend money at that point. Um, I mean, maybe you're just really lucky and you've got tons of money in the bank and it's not a major consideration and raising is totally inevitable. So, you know, yep, that, that from a financial point of view, you probably don't have a lot of risk there. Um, the other thing is, you know, closing around and raising money is just massively time consuming and mentally consuming. So, I, I wouldn't distract yourself by these legal movements. I just do the minimum amount that you have to, um, which is, in my opinion, kind of make sure that you've got solid legal counsel lined up, that you've talked to them about what the structure is today. And if they identify any red flags that you should be trying to clean up early and often, then, you know, run that course. But I wouldn't distract yourself with a ton of activity um, that, you know, inevitably is going to be included in the cycle anyway. Uh, but just, I, I would give those people that you're relying on for advice a, a heads up well in advance. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Just making sure that all of the, I, I think making sure that your house is in order with respect to which entity is signing which contracts between the U.S. sub and the Australian entity. So where are certain where are certain assets owned, where is certain income earned, making sure you've got that understood and well documented, um, and then making sure that information is in the hands of you know, your lawyers and accountants so that when you go to do the flip, they can help you. But I don't think, you know, you can't like dissolve the US sub if, if it's active and it owns assets and owns contracts without incurring a bunch of costs to move all of that up to Australia. So you, you sort of have to incur costs if you have a, a real living, breathing US sub. Um, and so I think Matt's exactly right. You'd want to wait on those costs. Just make sure you've got your ducks in a row and all the information is in the right people's hands and you've got a plan and then you can execute on that plan once you have a fundraiser. Cool. Um, just uh, while we're talking about sort of advisors, like who who is the panel of people that you need to, to do a flip up on the Australian side and the US side? Yeah, so you want Australian and US lawyers. Um, you know, on the US side, you don't really need separate tax lawyers, US corporate and venture lawyers, because it's pretty simple analysis. You're forming a brand new company in the US. So it's a pretty simple tax analysis that the U.S. lawyers can probably do the tax analysis there. Um, on the Australian side, you probably want Australian corporate and tax counsel, legal counsel, because for Australia, that's where making sure that the rights of the Australian entity are exactly mirrored in the U.S. entity are key from a tax perspective. So that's where tax counsel can be kind of valuable. Um, sometimes those people can be the same people or work within the same firm. And, you know, the, the corporate person just needs to ask a couple questions of the tax person. Um, and then you'll need, um, 
you know, US and Australian accountants, not necessarily for the flip, but to get all the information surrounding it and make the filings and the stamp, you know, the stamp duty filing in Australia and all that sort of stuff. And then on a go forward basis in the US to, to help with the US accounting side of things. Uh, and then you'll want some sort of eventually, maybe not necessarily right at the flip, some sort of international tax transfer pricing analysis. And, you know, that could be depending on who you're using for US and Australian accounting or US or Australian legal, um, both, you know, uh, accounting firms and law firms have that expertise in house. So hopefully among that group, somebody in that group will have the international transfer pricing expertise in house. Um, and you can, you can, uh, you can get that person, um, allow myself one shameless pitch. Uh, you know, the nice thing about DLA in, in these transactions, and I think why I've been fortunate enough to be able to work on a few of them is that we have Australian presence, both tax and corporate law. Uh, we have tons of US legal presence, corporate and tax. And, you know, part of maybe why I'm in Seattle here doing some of this is that I have international tax colleagues housed in Seattle. So, you know, next door to me, I've got somebody that I can ask the international tax questions of. So, you know, it's kind of nice sometimes to get that all in one spot. And then you can have a quarterback, as Matt said, who, who you run it through rather than trying to, um, you know, coordinate seven different service providers across seven different seven different law firms and accounting firms and entities. But that's, that's shameless. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and won't, won't give any more of those. I, I would echo that, though. I think that having a single point of contact to a large extent or at least a point of contact that can quarterback the process is pretty important. Um, this does get pretty complicated. And if you try and do it yourself and try and figure it out, like, A, it's just a massive waste of time for you as a founder to try and do that. But B, it's, it's just complex stuff. And if you don't have someone there that's coordinating what inevitably becomes a bit of a team and that's kind of scrumming around this problem then and, and the challenge, then it makes it really difficult to coordinate things quickly and, and have someone kind of cracking that whip. Um, I think the other advisor there that the other two advisors there that um, I would suggest that as a founder, you kind of um, include in, in your overall process in conjunction uh, with this one is just get someone that you, that, that can give a very, very strong and educated point of view on R and D uh, and uh, the R and D grant implications of the process just to make sure that they're across it and they're advising you on any red flags that uh, or, or just helping uh, within the broader conversation of the structure and the docs that are going to be needed immediately after the flip um, to make sure that that's still viable um, have them in place I think the other one is as an individual and, and the founder usually flipping up an entity coincides with being employed and moving your personal um, uh, equity in the company um, to the US uh, I'd be definitely looking at getting more of an individual um, level tax advice um, just, just for yourself as a founder and figure out the, any implications there down the line um, as it relates to any kind of capital event or liquidity or you know, whatever, just to make sure that you, you understand that early um, and uh, how it relates to common structures in Australia, like family trusts and or, or personal holdings of common stock, et cetera. So, um, they're probably the two other advisors that I'd add into that mix. And are they typically the same person and they, are they an accountant or are they a tax lawyer, Matt? Uh, they, those two things would typically be separate. Um, but an R&D R &D person, I mean, the person that we used is an R&D um, applications grant and tax specialist. So... Um, he's incredibly knowledgeable about the, 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 the scheme, um, the legal requirements, the reporting requirements, and the, you know, uh, I guess the, the international obligations that you have once you do a flip. So that's pretty different to more of a general and, and personal tax, international tax advisor, which would be the latter part of that uh, group. Um, I mean, maybe there's someone there that could do both, but I doubt it. Sam, I think you're on mute. Such a loser. Um, sorry. Uh, so is that a good uh, segue then to um, talk about R&D implications more, more generally and, and what you learned from the experience at Schedulo? Uh, can, can I maybe, Matt, before you, you get into your specific circumstances, can I maybe give one just high level disclaimer on that? Um, you know, there, there's a little bit of a tension between the flip up and the R&D tax credit. Um, I'm, I'm outside of my depth here because this is, you know, Australian tax, but my understanding is 
the IP has to be owned and housed in the Australian entity um, post-closing in order to take advantage of the R&D tax. And then that means that the transfer pricing uh, arrangement between the Australian sub that owns the IP and the U.S. parent um, where, you know, presumably if you get U.S. financing, a, a lot of sales are going to be in the U.S., the relationship between how that IP is, you know, distributed out of the U.S. entity in the U.S. Uh, has to be defined. And there's a distribution model, which is the ideal perspective to keep tax costs down and keep IP owned um, at the at the Australian level. Um, I'll, I'll avoid getting into all of the specifics, but essentially, in order to take advantage of that distribution model, you have to be able to, with a straight face, say certain things about your technology and how it's being stri distributed, and more importantly, who's signing contracts and who's making the ultimate decision to contract and make sales decisions, and where those people are physically situated when they make those decisions and when they sign those contracts, which you know gets to be a, a fairly complicated fact-specific analysis um, and can create kind of a little bit of a necessary dance and a one-two step for the, for the founding team. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I would just say um, caution that, that doing the flip and, and taking advantage of the R&D credit is tricky to navigate and requires some attention to detail on a go forward basis in terms of how you're authorizing contracts. And I think that's, that's all that, you know, everything else is too fact specific to get into here. So I'll let uh, Matt talk about, you know, his specific experiences and probably much more in depth about the R&D tax credit itself. Yeah, I, I definitely um, echo the, the point that it is fairly nuanced and fairly detailed, and, and that's why I think we do need very um, uh, you know, reasonably educated advice um, specific to the R&D grant when you're doing this and that they're lockstep with whoever's quarterbacking the, the rest of the process. Um, this is definitely not <laughs> uh, like, you know, locked in stone on, on tablet kind of advice. Um, my recommendation is absolutely get advice for all of this stuff, obviously, but this one in particular, because uh, it is different depending on the circumstances of where you sell your product, which company and which entity, whether it's the US or uh, Australia is actually contracting with the customer and all of that stuff because it impacts transfer agreements like uh, Tyler indicated. Um, if, if the US uh, entity ultimately is the owner of the IP, you can actually still claim the R&D um, but there's a bunch more hoops that you have to uh, jump through and there's a bunch more scrutiny that's applied to the process. Um, so I think largely the advice from anyone that's giving you guidance on R&D and, and how to apply for it and when to apply for it um, would, would be to uh, maintain IP ownership in the Australian entity. Um, under that scenario, it's much, much more straightforward to continue claiming the R&D tax incentive even after a flip up. If the U.S. is the top co and, and the, the headquarter and the Australian sub is the uh, one that owns the IP, then um, it's, it's you know, almost as straightforward as just uh, registering for it and claiming it as a, a single Australian entity. But it is still possible to do it um, if the IP is owned in the U.S. It's just much more complicated and uh, subsequently more expensive, I think, to get advice each year as you go through that process and a bunch more hurdles you have to jump through. Um, I think that that's uh, my advice in terms of where the IP ownership is is stored. But ultimately, as well, um, the the question that you have to answer as a, as a company if you're going through a flip up is, are you are you actually fundamentally keeping engineering and your research and development effort in Australia? Um, some organisations, obviously, going through a flip up exercise, may not be, and they may be relocating all of their R and D effort. Uh, to the US. So I think there's things that just completely eliminate um, the, your, your potential to um, apply for the R&D. Um, obviously, there's some fairly strict criteria straight on the front end, even, even before they look at where the IP is uh, stored as to whether you're actually performing uh, and employing people related to R&D uh, activity in the Australian entity full stop. And if you're not, then none of this really applies because you're essentially forfeiting that, that whole opportunity. Um, for us, and in Scheduler's experience, all of our product and R&D um, engineering team is based in Australia, um, and most of our sales and go-to-market team are based in the US, and um, I'm there as well. Um, there are a few other implications that we have, which are interesting, I think, to call out, which are kind of common um, misunderstandings around the R&D uh, 
tax implications and when you you know have a have a global operation. If you've got people in the U.S. that are working in in Topco and they're actually contributing to R and D activity, um, then you can actually claim for their time as well um, uh, with some fairly strict criteria. And the, the main one being where is the majority of activity being um, performed, and if you are claiming um, R and D grant um, percentages and time and cost uh, in the Australian entity in that structure. Um, then you, you do need to go through an additional process, which is to pre-apply for that activity and pre-justify at a much more detailed level what employees or what uh, employees where they've, they've got a charge back to that Australian entity, um, what activity they're doing and how they're contributing to that larger body of work that's being performed in Australia. Um, so there's, there are still ways to claim those activities, but um, there, there's some fairly sort of strict guidelines around how that can be done. And again, that's where I'd recommend uh, highly to get someone who's specialised in the, the rules and regulations around R and D and how that can be applied. Is there um, someone you would recommend for that, Matt, in Australia? Yeah, I mean, the guy that we work with, we've worked with from day one, and he's been excellent. Um, he he was working at PwC uh, in this function exclusively, and he's since moved to a small, uh, you know, uh, accounting firm in in Brisbane. I'm more than happy to uh, pass these details on to you and for you to share that around the, the portfolio. He's excellent, um, extremely knowledgeable, and it's, it's, you know, it's very affordable advice for us. Um, so yeah, 100%. Excellent. Um, Michael has actually asked a question um, in the chat. So quick question, we're currently recruiting a VP of BD or sales in the US and wondering if we should A, employ him or her as a contractor or B, employ him or her as an employee in the Australian entity or C, set up a US subsidiary and have them be an employee of the US subsidiary. Sounds like the US subsidiary will cause problems down the track. Uh, I don't think it would cause, yeah, tax you can, uh, sorry, Tyler, you can probably weigh in here as well, but I don't know that it would cause, cause problems, just complexity. Yeah, so in terms of um, whether the person is classified as a contractor or an employee, if you do it through the US uh, entity, the sub, that isn't a determination that the IRS allows you to make. You're literally, it's sort of a, is he really a contractor or is he really an employee? And it's a walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck test. So if he's full time, if he reports back up to you, et cetera, et cetera, then even if you call him a contractor, they're gonna say he's an employee and say you should have done withholdings for him and paid that to the IRS. Um, so I think yeah. you need to be careful of that if you employ him through the US. If you employ him out of the Australian entity, I'm not sure what the personal tax implications to him would be. Um, I, I, you know, I tend to do corporate stuff, so I don't know the, U.S. you know employee level implications of that, but I think you know foreign earned income is treated differently. So um, I think you definitely want to get some tax advice. Uh, you probably have him get some tax advice uh, if you're thinking about employing him out of the Australian entity, and then if you're employing him out of the U.S. entity, just be careful that you're, you're classifying him correctly as an employer or contractor. And then I think Matt's point that it, you know it, it, it it's not a problem to have him employed out of the U.S. entity. Because what you do in the sandwich structure, um, this is the part that I didn't get to in order to fix it, is you at closing of the flip up, sell the equity in the sub, the, the current US sub from the Australian entity to the new US parent entity. So that post closing, the US parent entity is the parent of both the Australian sub and the old US sub. So effectively you have two operating subs. You have a US operating sub, and an Australian operating sub, and then the US hold co is purely for owning the equity. Um, and then the operations and the contracts and the employment is all down at those two levels. So in that scenario, the employee would continue to be employed or as a contractor via the US sub, and then you could hire you know, further contractors and employees into that US sub as well. So I don't, I don't think it, from that point, it creates a problem. You just have to be careful on the employee versus contractor distinction in the US. And then if you wanna do it through Australia, what the implications are there from a tax perspective. Yeah, and if I was to stack rank in, in order of complexity and just like pain in the ass factor across those three options, like employing them as a contractor, even if it's for the short term, is probably the least complex and least pain in the neck, but probably the most fraught with 
risk just around things like classification that um, Tyler mentioned there. I'd say there's also implications if you're, if like equity or um, options is part of their compensation, then I think that would be more difficult. And you know, Tyler can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I suspect that would be the case. Um, the other thing that obviously it, it puts a lot more onus and responsibility and risk on the employee to organize things in the US like their own healthcare um, and in the US, that's a particularly important issue for most employees. Um, to, to give you some perspective, I think we employed our first American, American employee um, for the first 30 to 45 days or maybe even two months of their employment. They were a contractor to the Australian entity. Um, they had something called COBRA healthcare coverage. It was kind of like a government you know, subsidized rollover of their previous employees' healthcare coverage while they were looking for a new job, technically. And then um, as soon as we incorporated our original sort of US sub under the Australian entity, um, then, you know, we just, we used a payroll provider um, called Trinet, which kind of wrapped up payroll uh, in, employment um, complexities and healthcare all into one. And uh, that made it a lot easier for us. So contracting would be easy, but I'd say there's like hidden complications that you need to be aware of you know, employing them directly out of the Australian entity, I'd probably say is the most complicated and complex. And then I'd say the most logical there is just set up a US code, even if you're not flipping up, if your intention is not to, you know, do that, or there's no compelling need to just spend that money right now, then um, set up a, a US entity, accept that there'll be some complication down the line when you do flip up. Um, but at least you've solved this initial problem of employing someone there and it being relatively uncomplex. I mean, setting up a company and kicking that process off is pretty easy and quick. We have two more minutes. Um, just wondering if there was anything else, Tyler or Matt, that you guys wanted to talk about or any other outstanding questions? Nothing else for me to address. I think I, I hit all my points. So I'll just see if other people have questions. I think generally speaking, my advice as a founder, um, having gone through this exercise is, you know, firstly find great legal advice and, and, and just accept the fact that this process will cost you money. Um, this is definitely not something you want to do yourself um, or even try and manage yourself in my opinion it's it's too complex and building kind of a team around you that can help uh, is super important um, but just try and do it as cash efficiently as you can and maybe don't don't overthink the timing don't try and do it too early just because you it sounds like a good idea at least have some kind of compelling event um, if you're already up and running as a company and you're incorporated in australia uh, i wouldn't try and uh, overthink you know pulling that trigger too quickly um, and, and just be mindful of making sure your house is in order, just the complexity of the business structure and shareholder and equity and everything like that in the Australian entity and, and be aware of anything that could come up that could complicate the process like employee stock options or convertible notes throughout the, the process. Um, I think just make sure your head's above water on those things and everyone around the table is aware of what's going on there. Um, I'm oh, sorry, finish up Matt, sorry. No, that was it, thanks. Oh, I was going to say that I think um, really good sort of count, uh, um, additional point building off of what Matt was saying there is that, you know, I think a lot of people totally understandably are wary to talk to their lawyers about things or too much because, um, you know, lawyers charge by the hour and it's expensive and our rates are high. And I am completely sympathetic to that, especially in a startup that's trying to bootstrap. Um, but I also think the more you disclose and talk about and explain early on, the fewer problems that crop up later and the easier it is to structure around them and to clean them up at the outset, or at least be mindful of what the cost and the timeline are going to be. And when those things spring up later, it's much more complicated to correct them and fix them. So, you know, just try to be, you think of everything you can that might be out there from an equity promise standpoint or a complicating standpoint and try to get it out on the table early. Um, I think that helps keep costs down and plan. And hopefully, you know, you find a lawyer that you trust and have a rapport with and, you know, any lawyers doing this flip up, so now switching out of the pitching for myself mode, any lawyers doing this on the US side should be venture lawyers. Um, and that's really a specialty in the US, I think more than it is in Australia. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of them in Silicon Valley and Seattle, 
Um, so there's no shortage of lawyers that are used to dealing with startups and dealing with these issues and, and helping you in an in a efficient manner. So making sure you find someone that's willing to do that and take the time to talk to you on the outset without billing and without running up costs to plan accordingly and keep costs down is, is really important. And you know, there's lots of lawyers that can, that can help you do that. Um, just making sure you find the right one is key. Awesome. Okay, so I think that's time, everyone. Um, thanks very much for joining and for bringing your questions. And of course, very much to um, Tyler and to Matt for um, leading the discussion. Um, I think the plan from here is to do a little bit of editing and we'll, we'll actually release the, the video in some way and also um, a blog post or something similar like that. Just as we were talking, um, I, it occurred to me that you know, some of these phrases around like getting your house in order and speaking early, um, are really um, easy to say in hindsight, but what isn't clear up front is what that even means. And I was thinking we might try and pull together like a checklist of like, here are 10 things or whatever that you should, you should get done um, if you're thinking about flipping up. So to help structure that conversation early. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone and have a good day or have a good evening. Thank you so much, Sam. Thanks, Sam. It was awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. Bye. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye.